Let's revise some AQA medical physics. We're going to start off by looking at the eye as an optical refracting system. In order to really understand the eye, we really need to understand lenses first. So the eye consists actually of a converging lens and that focuses all of the visible light onto the retina across here. Well, how do lenses work? There are a few things that we need to remember about lenses. First of all, if we have an incident ray that is parallel to the principal axis, and the principal axis is just this axis, let me just use my digital ruler, so this here is our principal axis across here. Well, if a ray is parallel, it will refract through the lens and will pass through the principal focus on the other side. If a incident ray passes right for the center of the lens, it will just carry on being completely undisturbed. Just a little note that we can also have diverging lenses, and here's a typical lens diagram that you will need to be able to recreate. Um, as you can see, the individual rays will actually diverge. A couple of things to remember, if we have a ray that is parallel to the principal axis, it will refract through the lens, but it will appear to have come from the focus. Now, the focal point of a diverging lens will be right here, or the principal focus as it's often known. The incident ray passing through the center of the lens will just carry on going in the same direction. Notice that the image will now be on the same side as the object. There are two types of images that we need to be aware of. First of all, we have a real image. For example, in the case of a converging lens right over here, we have a real image. Why is that? Two very important identifiers. First of all, it's on the other side of the lens. If it's on the other side of the lens, that means that it is real. By real, I mean that it's the actual rays that have passed through, refracted, that end up forming the image, which in this case is actually inverted. Why is it inverted? Because this image goes here, or this light ray goes here, then it gets refracted, and then goes down along here, whilst this one here gets refracted upwards, goes through the principal focus, and ends up creating the image. Now, in the case of the virtual image, the light rays appear to have come from a different point. So, for instance, if you're looking at yourself in a mirror, this is an example of a virtual image because it appears as if there's a person which is standing on the other side of the mirror, i.e. you, but that's not actually there. It's a virtual image image. In practice, if the image is on the same size and on the same side as the object, then we have an example of a virtual image. Additionally as well, because it's on the same side, we're going to talk about the lens equation in a little bit, uh, but the image distance is a negative number. I'm just going to write like that, negative number, where V is the image, uh, let's call it distance. Okay, so let me show you guys how to draw a ray diagram. First of all, uh, a few apologies because this is actually a little bit harder when I'm doing this on a tablet, but I shall do my best. Now, let's take a slightly stranger case. For instance, if the object is not directly at the principal axis, we can directly apply the laws that we've learned. So my object is just going to be this little arrow across here. Okay, then I'm going to draw a few rays. Typically, I just draw three rays and that is sufficient unless the question asks me to draw some more. 
Okay, well, I'm going to have a ray that is coming in this way. Should we draw, draw the rays with a different color? Ooh, which one should we go for? I'm going to go for this one here. Okay, so we have the rays kind of like coming in. And then as soon as, I, as soon as they hit the lens, they're going to refract. And then they're going to go through this focal point here, where this point here is the principal focus. Let's see if I can just about um, get my digital ruler to work. Trust me, guys, it's a lot easier when you actually do that on paper. Okay, cool. So we have one of the rays goes through there. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to start from the top again and then I'm going to draw yet another one and this one will go through the principal, um, through the center point of the lens and if it goes through the center point of the lens it will be completely undisturbed. Okay, so those two will intersect here. Now, let's pretty much repeat the process. However, this time we are going to go through the bottom of the lens. So I'm just going to change colors here just to show you guys and just to differentiate the two uh, bits. OK, so I'm going to go um, this way. And as, as soon as I hit the lens, this thing will converge and then it will go through the focal point. So. Uh, I can just about make it go through here and uh, then I'm going to repeat the process once again. However, this time I'm going to be going straight through. Okay, so I take my ruler, one of them is going to go through the center, the other one through the bottom of the lens, sort of this is just about right and then I'm going to go through there. Okay, this just about works. It's a little bit easier on graph paper. So what I now have are two points. So we can see that what I'm going to get is a real image and those orange rays here were the bottom of the object and those blue rays were the top of the object. So what I'm actually going to get is an inverted image that's actually magnified as well that's going to be on the other side like so. So this here is an example of a real image and how to draw it. Something which is very, very important with lenses is the lens equation. Okay, so let's say that the center line of the lens is just about here somewhere. I'm going to define a few really important quantities. Let's do that again, actually, because I want to go right through the, uh, through the center, even though my drawing is not absolutely perfect. Just kidding, it is absolutely perfect. Okay, well, the first uh, important distance that I'm going to cover is actually just this distance here, so I can just draw that a little bit better, like that, okay. So the distance from the object, and this here was our object, to the uh, center line of, um, of the lens is our object uh, distance, which is just U. Okay, the um, image distance is the distance from this center line to the line where the, uh, the image actually is, which is this distance here. And this is typically given the symbol V. Now, if the image is on the other side, V is negative and we have a virtual image. The final distance is the focal point. Oh, we've discovered a little mistake here, so let's just fix that. So the focal point or the focal um, distance is uh, the distance from the center of the lens to uh, the principal focus, which is just this distance here. Together, those quantities are linked by the famous lens equation that 1 over u plus 1 over v is equal to 1 over the focal length. 
Okay, so we've talked quite a lot about lenses, but how does that relate actually to medical physics? Well, the eye essentially acts like a lens, at least the cornea and the lens themselves. So let's have a look at the structure of the eye. First of all, we have the cornea, which is just a transparent, almost like a window of light. It lets light in and it has a high refractive index. Then we have the lens. It acts kind of like a fine focus and the muscles can control its shape, it can contract this way, it can be elongated, um, and all of this will change the focal point. The actual images, kind of like a screen, are formed on the retina. The most sensitive spot on the retina, retina, kind of just off of the principal axis, is the yellow spot and that contains the fovea, which um, has the highest density of uh, rods and cons, but we'll get to that um, in a minute. As we mentioned, the lens equation is one of the most important ones that we need to be aware of, given in the formula booklet, but 1 over f, 1 over the focal length is 1 over u plus 1 over v. Now, the actual power is given by 1 over the focal point, and that's given in diopters, or d. So the total power of the eye is actually the sum of the powers of the cornea and the lens, because um, essentially those two do all the focusing exactly like a lens that just converges this onto the retina. Oop, what happened here? Okay, now the furthest distance that our eyes can focus on is actually typically infinity unless um, we have a condition that we could correct with glasses. The closest distance, the maximum possible distance that our eyes can sort of fo comfort comfortably focus on is around 8 or 9 centimeters. If we're looking at close objects, the power of the eye increases as the focal length will actually decrease it. So if we keep bringing that um, focal length kind of closer and, um, and closer, uh, then uh, the power will increase because power is inversely proportional to the um, focal length. A couple of more notes about the retina. That consists of rods and cones, which are just photoreceptors. So they actually contain pigments, that end up bleaching when the light passes through them. This actually activates directly the optic nerve, directly behind the eye, and uh, that sends a signal to the brain. So whenever we're looking at something, the actual light uh, uh, activates them, sends a signal to the brain, and uh, the rest is kind of magic. Okay, now the cells then need to reset, and that's why we need vitamin a enzymes from the blood. Um, the cones themselves come in three varieties which are sensitive to each of the primary colors. So we have red, green and blue. Each will actually absorb a different range of wavelengths which are going to be interpreted as colors by the brain. We also need to know about spatial resolution. So we need at least one rod or cone between the line from two objects to distinguish them. Otherwise, the brain cannot resolve the two objects and they appear to be just one. So, for instance, if we're looking at something in the night sky, something like Saturn, I don't know, we can't see the rings because um, the light is way too spread out and um, the resolution is way too low, it appears as one object. The spatial resolution is best at the yellow spot because it has the highest density of those cons and rods cells. In other places, the spatial resolution tends to be a lot worse. We're going to talk about the defects of vision. We're going to start off with the word myopia, which is short-sightedness, and we actually need to know this word. Well, this is corrected with a diverging lens. Now, first of all, what is the problem without a lens in front of the eye? As you can see, we have those rays here, and they tend to focus, but they focus in front of the retina and not at the retina. And when that happens, we cannot actually focus on distant objects. 
It can occur if the power of the cornea slash lens are too, is too big or the actual eyeball is too long. So we need a lens of negative power to correct this. And what happens afterwards, once again we need to know this diagram, is that after the rays pass through this diverging lens, they end up focusing at the retina and we can see things in focus once again. We also need to know about hypermetropia or long-sightedness. In that case, you're unable to focus on objects that are close by. The near point is further than normal. As you can see across here, the objects tend to, or the light rays tend to focus after the retina. And uh, this is caused by the cornea or the lens having too little power or the eyeball itself is too short. As you can see, they tend to focus kind of like after this. A converging lens with positive power is used, i.e. your prescription in diopters is going to be positive, whereas with myopia, it will be negative. So what happens afterwards is we place a converging lens and that lens helps us focus at the retina. In both of those cases, we focus at the retina, but if the patient is short-sighted, we use a diverging lens. If they're long-sighted, hypermetropia, we use a converging lens. We also need to talk about astigmatism. Now, this is actually another defect which is caused by irregularly shaped corneal lens that have a different focal length for different planes. The image tends to appear blurry and a little bit displaced. So the horizontal lines may be in focus, but the vertical lines may not be in focus. And for that, we need cylindrical lenses are placed in front of the eye. The prescription looks a little bit different. We're going to have three different numbers, and I've seen that uh, appear sometimes in questions, so we need to be aware uh, what column is what. The first one is the power to correct either the short or the long sightedness. For instance, I myself am short sighted, and I think my description, uh, my prescription is around, uh, let's say around minus 2.5 uh, D. Then we're going to need the power to correct the astigmatism, I don't know, let's say minus 0.2. And finally, we need the angle uh, for the astigmatism, which is also known as the axis. Technically, it's the angle of the horizontal plane that doesn't need correcting, but it's just an angle between 0 and 180. Uh, I don't actually remember what mine is, but let's just say 50 degrees, for instance. And this here is an example of a prescription. The next part of the specification we're going to be revising is the physics of the ear. Now, because we're going to be treating the ear as a sound detection system, this is actually one of the points on the specification, we need to revise some of the sound wave formulae. The first and very important one is that intensity is equal to the power that's been transmitted through a cross-sectional area. So in this case here, I is the intensity. Remember the intensity is watts per meter squared. P here is the power measured in watts and A here is the area. Now, the intensity as well is proportional to the amplitude squared. Now, just don't get confused because this here is the amplitude, it's the maximum displacement from the equilibrium position um, of a wave, and A here is the area. In practice, because of the laws of proportionality, if you come across a problem, you can always say that I over A1 squared is equal to I2 over A2 squared. And typically, if that appears on a problem, you will have three of these and one unknown. Now, you can also have a look at this equation and for a 
point source. This is a very, very useful equation. You can kind of think of this equation as i as a function of distance. So for a point source, the intensity spreads like a sphere of radius r, which means that the intensity here will be the same all across the circle. If we were to get in a little bit closer, then the intensity will be higher and um, there will be an inverse, inverse square law relationship where p is the power and this here is 4 pi, 4 pi r squared. Okay, well, let's apply this to a little problem. We have a sound which is produced with a power of 10 watts. Let's calculate the intensity of that sound, let's say 10 meters away. Okay, well, I'm gonna use the formula from above. So I will be the power over four pi r squared. Now my power is just 10 watts. Let's divide that by four pi. The numbers are quite easy here. So it's gonna be 10 squared. And if we put this into a calculator, we're going to get around 7.95 times 10 to the power of minus 3. And uh, remember, the units are watts per meter squared. We can use this formula to calculate the intensity at a distance r away from a point source. Okay, next let's have a look at the structure of the year. But first of all, check out my artistic skills. We're gonna start off with the outer year. So if you can't tell from my artistic skills, this year is the outer year indeed. Okay, so first of all, um, the outer year consists of the pinner, which essentially acts like kind of like a funnel. It brings in all the sound waves into the auditory canal. This bit here in the middle, surprisingly, is known as the middle ear, and that consists of the ossicles and the uh, eustachian tube. I think that's the way we pronounce that. That actually connects the middle ear to the throat. We also have the inner ear, which consists of the semicircular canals, the cochlea, the auditory nerve, which uh, will actually connect the whole thing to the, uh, to the brain. Okay, well, let's have a look at how this thing actually works. Well, in order to do so, we're going to need to look at the um, transmission process, which is a point from the specification. So as we said, the waves are channeled into the auditory canal by the pinna, which is essentially the outer ear across here. The sound energy is concentrated onto a smaller area, which means that the intensity increases. If the area goes down, the intensity will increase as they're as they're inversely proportional. A sound wave is a longitudinal wave and that's going to essentially vibrate the um, eardrum which is here. It's also known as the tympanic um, membrane which is the boundary between the outer and the middle ear. Now these vibrations are passed then along this line here. So uh, just to recap, the uh, waves come in here and they vibrate your eardrum and then the vibrations are passed onto the malleus, then the incus, and then the stapes onto the oval window just here. Okay, so once we're at the oval window, that actually separates the middle ear from the inner ear. Ear. The inner ear is filled with perilymph, which is a fluid, and it allows vibrations to be passed to the basilar membrane, the cochlea, and uh, eventually to the auditory nerve. Okay, now the ossicles actually transmit and amplify the vibrations. The intensity is pretty much always increased because the area keeps getting smaller and smaller, which means that the intensity keeps getting big, bigger and bigger. Okay, the oval window has a smaller area in the, in, than the eardrum and that will, resume, that will result in a larger pressure variation, larger intensity. And um, the vibration will be transmitted to the fluid in the inner ear and the sound wave is transmitted, the amplitude decreases, but remember that period or slash the frequency will be a constant. 
And now let's talk about sensitivity and frequency response. So humans can generally hear frequencies from about 20 hertz to around 20,000 hertz. But the sensitivity depends on the frequencies. So at high frequency, you need a greater change for the frequency to actually be registered. For instance, uh, what do I mean by that? We might be able to tell the difference between, I don't know, 40 and 50 hertz. Uh, relatively easily. However, the difference between 19,340 and 19,350 may be really difficult to hear. We also need to be familiar with this graph. On the y-axis we have intensity and on the x-axis we have frequency. We also have the threshold of feeling which is around one watt per meter squared and after that you can feel the sound. We have the minimum intensity for a sound to be heard. Well that's just represented by the boundary of this graph here and inside of this region is where sound can actually be heard and uh, outside of this region across here sound cannot be heard. We need to talk about the relationship between perceived loudness and intensity. Now that is non-linear, i.e. it's logarithmic. The formula for it is that delta L is proportional to the logarithm of the final and the initial intensity. Now what does that mean in practice? That means that every time the intensity, let's say doubles, quadruples, etc, um, every time it uh, doubles it will be changed, delta L will be changing by the same factor. That's the nature of the logarithms. We also need a logarithmic scale for, um, for loudness and here comes the decibel. We can actually measure loudness using a decibel meter and that is a log scale or logarithmic scale for intensity. Here's a formula given in the formula sheet that the intensity level in decibels, so let me just write here dB, is actually going to be equal to 10 multiplied by the log of I over I naught. Um, I is the intensity and I naught is the threshold of the hearing intensity. So you're given the value of I naught in your formula booklet, you don't need to remember that, but I'm just going to write it down over here that I naught is equal to around 1.0 times 10 to the power of minus 12 watts per meter squared. Now let's apply this to a problem. Let's say that we are at a rock concert or something really, really loud or maybe like something like, I don't know, a Formula One race and we hear a sound with intensity of one watt per meter squared. And what we need to do is convert this reading to decibels. Okay, well, the intensity level, I'm just going to write this as IL in decibels, so just given by 10 multiplied by the log, the log base 10 of the intensity, which is just 1 divided by I naught. But remember, I naught is just 1 times 10 to the power minus 12, which is the same as 1 over 10 to the power minus 12. Now, if we put this into a calculator, we're going to get a very, very loud sound, unhealthy um, loud sound of around 120 uh, decibels. And this is how this equation actually works. Now, we also need to be aware of this curve here for the exam. And uh, in this curve, which is known as the equal loudness curve. On the y-axis we have the intensity in decibels, on the x-axis we have frequency. Now one of the things to mention is that 
sounds of the same intensity level have the same loudness for the average human ear, where the phone is the unit of perceived loudness. So let's say that the intensity level was 20 decibels, then this means that this curve here is going to have 20 phones. And this curve here at 100 decibels is going to have 100 phones at 1000 Hertz. So at 1000 Hertz, this will be 100 if this is 100, and at 1000 Hertz, if this here is 20, this here will be 20. We also need to be aware of the defects of hearing. So if we're to plot intensity levels against frequency, a normal hearing curve will kind of looks like this. In fact, um, I'm pretty sure we need to know that the lowest level of normal hearing or the lowest uh, intensity level happens around uh, 3000 Hertz or so. But if we have some age-related hearing loss, then this curve will look like this. But we can also have some hearing loss that's been induced by an event, so, or such as a rock concert, or uh, wearing too much headphones, or things like that. Um, well, the curve will then have this weird shape where it kind of like reaches a peak here and then goes down. But in either cases, we're gonna need louder intensities to hear the same frequencies compared to the normal hearing. In general, the lower the, this curve is, the lower intensities we can actually hear, meaning that our hearing is better. Our next part of the specification is the simple ECG machines and the normal ECG waveform. Now, in order to understand ECG machines, we need to understand the heart. Here's a classic uh, diagram of the heart, which is essentially just a double pump. Now, the left and right hand side have an atrium and a ventricle, which are separated by a valve. The left hand side pumps blood from the lungs to the rest of the body, and the right hand side is going to pump blood from the body backwards to the lungs. The blood enters the atria from the veins and the atria contract. The blood enters the ventricles and the pressure there. It's actually kind of squeezed in there. The ventricles then contract themselves and the blood is squeezed into the arteries. Okay, now why are we studying this, this in physics? Well, few different reasons. Number one, the heart is a muscle and muscles contract and relax via electrical signals. So uh, how does that happen? We have specialized cell in the right atrium that produce signal at a staggering rate around 70 times a minute. These signals spread through the atria and make them contract. The signal goes through the outraventricular node, the signal is delayed there for around 0.1 seconds, and then it's passed onto the ventricles which contract, and then the process repeats itself. Okay, well, what is an electrocardiogram? We can actually detect these signals onto the skin, and um, an electrocardiogram, or an ECG, is just a graph of potential difference against time. So if these things had, had a scale, uh, well, it does have a scale, but what we would get is that on the x-axis, we're going to have potential difference on the y, typically in millivolts, and on the, um, y, on the y-axis, excuse me, we're going to have potential difference, and on the x-axis, we are just going to have time. Okay. Well, one heartbeat is going to be split into the following. First of all, we have a P wave, which is the first part of the cycle. The signal is generated that causes the atria to contract. This is our first signal. Then we have the QRS waves, which happens while the ventricles themselves are contracting. And finally, we have the T wave, which happens when the ventricles are relaxing. How do we obtain an ECG trace? Well, electrodes are placed on the body and the potential difference is measured over time. 
Um, the electrodes need to be placed as close to the heart as possible, so we don't place them in faraway uh, locations such as the right leg, for instance. Um, the signal is very, very attenuated. Now, what does that mean? It just means that it's very weak, it's been um, absorbed multiple times and re-emitted, and the signal that reaches the skin is very, very low, typically of the order of millivolts or even smaller. So we're going to need to amplify that with, um, with an amplifier. The electrodes are placed close to the heart and the patient should be as still as possible. We often also use a conductive gel. We can also improve the accuracy of an ECG with making sure that uh, we do that far away from any AC sources to reduce any potential interference. Let's also quickly revise endoscopy. Uh, so how does that work? Well, we're gonna use the properties of fiber optics as applied to this study. So they transmit light via total internal reflection. The core is made out of glass and we also have some cladding on the outside with just a little bit of a lower refractive index. If the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle, the light will be totally internally reflected. Some amount of light will be lost if the angle of incidence is below the critical angle um, because they're going to have quite a high, quite a low critical angle, most of the light will end up being transmitted. Now, these optical fibers are typically used in bundles in the endoscope, which is used for medical imaging. Now, an endoscope will contain two bundles, uh, which often appear in exam questions. For instance, you can be asked to explain um, what they might be, those particular bundles. Uh, they're coherent and non-coherent. For the coherent ones, we have the fixed arrangement of fibers at each end, and they're used to transmit images. We also have the non-coherent ones which are random arrangement of fibers and they're just used to eliminate the body for the imaging to be placed. So they, in a way, they just transmit light. The resolution of the instrument will depend on how thin the fibers actually are. The thinner they are, the greater the resolution and the more uh, detail we can see in the image that's being produced. Okay, this video is getting quite long, so one final thing that I'm going to be revising today is the basic principle of the MRI. Now, the MRI allows the cross-sections of the patients to be scanned with magnetic fields, and it's also excellent for imaging soft tissue. Now, protons are initially aligned with the spins parallel, and spinning protons will process about the magnetic field field lines of a superconducting magnet. We actually use gradient coils for scanning. Um, those are the ones that produce those short range, uh, short radio frequency pulses. So the way it works is they initially excite the protons, they go to a higher energy state and they change their spin state. When they de-excite and they lower in energy levels, photons are emitted. These are radio frequency photons. The radio frequency pulses are detected and they're used by a computer to construct an image. Let's just explore this point a little bit more. What does that actually mean? So before the application of the magnetic field, the protons are initially kind of spinning randomly. Uh, but once we start off the magnetic field, all of these spins are aligned in that parallel direction into the magnetic field. Okay guys, now as I said this video is getting very very long and it does not cover the entire specification. You also need to cover, uh, please have a look at your actual spec and use it as a checklist, but you also need to cover uh, topics such as ultrasound scanning, radioactive isotopes, ultrasound imaging, CT scans, etc. Now I've covered a lot of those in my general medical physics video right over here, including stuff like x-rays and x-ray attenuation coefficients. Hopefully you guys find that useful. Good luck revising.